This is the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, also known as the Plastic Vortex of the Pacific. It's a sea of debris and garbage that's estimated to be twice the size of Texas. Parts of it measure 100 feet deep, 90% of it is plastic, 100% of which is non-biodegradable. Not only have we created an entire continent of human waste, we're now washing up our garbage upon distant shores. This, you're, what you're looking at here is Pagan Island. The locals call it Shopping Beach because if they need a pair of flip-flops, a lighter, or a ball for their kids, they come right here. Remnants of our excess. So how on earth did things get like this? Here. Uh, this coming up is an image of uh, Life magazine from 1955. It was entitled Throw Away Living. In it, the article celebrated this whole new era where every one of us could have more than we ever wanted individually in our own homes and simply toss and replace anything we no longer wanted. Problem is, since this image, we've consumed over a third of our planet's natural resources, 50 years. Because hidden to most of us is a massive system of extraction, production, distribution, and waste that's generated with every single item we touch, every gadget, every item of clothing, every unnecessary purchase, has a huge planetary cost beyond the price tag. And this isn't just an environmental issue. Hyperconsumption is now an issue that is broadcasted live on TV all the time with hoarders. People are buried alive in their own stuff, in the things that we accumulate. And I know you watch shows like this and you're like, at least I'm not like those people. But I'd argue that most of us just hide it better, or we have deeper closets, or we have things like this personal storage facilities. These are popping up everywhere. It is a mass industry that's bigger than Hollywood today. There are more of these now than there are Starbucks cafes. The crazier thing is that since the last 50 years, home sizes have actually doubled while family sizes have halved, and yet we still don't seem to have enough room for all of our stuff, do we? Not only that, we are now working harder than ever to own more than ever, and yet every stat seems to indicate that we're also lonelier than ever. One positive stat I thought I saw recently was that 83% of us would actually gladly help a neighbor in need, which is awesome, but the same study also showed that 75% of us don't even know our neighbor's names. So major disconnect there. On top of that, we're bombarded by over 3,000 ads every single day. I have two daughters, and I'm pretty sure they know the details of every Disney cartoon princess character, more so than that of real, live, living, breathing people. And so the thing is, companies today, they don't simply meet desires, they manufacture them. <clears throat> Things like this. I saw this at Chapters the other day. I think it's a wallet, but I just find it fascinating that we can now go out and buy products that tell us to go buy more products. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's crazy, as if owning things was the answer. If you've seen Fight Club, the movie, they have this great line where they say, the things you own end up owning you. One author calls this affluenza, a contagious, socially transmitted disease of overload, debt, anxiety, and waste due to the pursuit of more, or the lie that we do not have enough. And I believe it was Gandhi who once said that the world does have enough for everybody's need, but not enough for everybody's greed. You might recall that uh, some pepper spraying incidences or shootings at Walmart sales, one story that always stuck with me was when Walmart actually egged on a crowd by saying, blitz line starts here, and a crowd ends up rushing and trampling over a 260 pound man to death, and when they try closing down the store, customers are incensed out of the injustice of not being able to get the sale item they wanted. And so, obviously, there's, we're at an important time in history. Two things we know for certain, one, is that things are more messed up than ever in terms of the environment, climate change, community degradation, and really just our whole sense of identity today. But two, the good news is we got ourselves into this mess. Odds are we can probably start innovating our way out of it. Tech connectivity is something astounding, something I love, but what if we could actually make connections that are as deep as they are wide today? What if it wasn't about how many followers we all had, but how many meaningful engagements we could create? What if we could actually take online tools to create offline world that's more sustainable and better and healthier for all. I'm part of a startup called Unstash, and we connect people and things. So think of the power tool you bought, used once, and never touched again. Or maybe that upcoming camping trip you have, do you really need to go and buy a brand new tent for that one singular occasion? Could we, through sharing, actually help each other save money, curb overconsumption, deepen community engagement while creating a more sustainable planet? That's our mission. 
and we're amongst a number of organizations that are helping make the shift towards collaborative living. Rideshare, for example, they take carpooling to new heights. Feast on it, I'm also part of that, creates inspiring social dining experiences. Uh, and then Clue, the guys in the corner there, I love them. They take sharing to the extreme. They help people share each other's toilets, and you really got to go to the city and can't find a public washroom. <laughs> and so uh, what I want to get at is there really is a movement underway. And there's campaigns like this, Make Something Day, or Adbuster Magazine runs Buy Nothing Day. But I'm sure you sense it too. There is this new resurgence going back to this DIY maker-creator movement where we can all re-embrace this idea of being fundamentally creators as opposed to consumers. I ran a series of events in a nightclub connecting local artists with charitable organizations uh, for a while. And this one I think particularly was for building a well in Uganda. But every single event we would have collaborative art, art projects that anybody could participate in. And the most amazing thing I found was that people would just be lit up and alive whenever they got a chance to not simply watch and consume, but to actually create, participate, and make a mark for the evening. And so I want to bring it back to every one of you. And you know, you don't need to run a web startup or launch a movement or anything like that to help redefine what matters in our world. And I would love if every single one of us could honestly ask ourselves tonight, you know, are there skills and gifts and things and passions and ideas within us that the world might be longing for us to share? Two reasons that matter to me, why this matters a lot to me, my daughters. I know they're consuming here, but they're also collaborating and sharing. Um, and one day my kids, your kids, will turn to us and ask us, you know, in a time in human history when just about anything was possible, what on earth do we do with ourselves? And so I'll end with this final image from Occupy. And what if a better world is possible? What if the best things in life weren't just things? Is it possible that we could actually own less and yet live more? And could we collectively leave this beautiful world better than the way we found it? Thanks.